when I look at uh, cases like Brown, that was the most imminent Supreme Court case dealing with people of color, and particularly in education ever. Now while we can sit here and say, man, it was great, I'm glad we did segregate it because it had some wonderful, wonderful um, results. It is your job as a scholar to teach even other people to think critically and examine everything because in hindsight of Brown, there were some things that really hurt us as a community that we have to be able to own so that we can do something about it. First of all, there's this notion that before and after desegregation, everything about white schools were great and everything about black schools were bad. And the black children were the ones who had to bear the, the change to reap the benefits of it. If it were truly equal, wouldn't white folks White kids have been bused to black schools as well. Would those black schools have the same amount of supplies and funding? Didn't happen that way. Before Brown versus Board of Education, there were African American teachers, black teachers, who taught in addition to academic, uh, in addition uh, to academic knowledge, survival skills, ethnic uh, uh, heritage affirmations, how to navigate this racist world that we live in. So these kids got bused to the other side of town, other side of the railroad tracks, sitting in seats where they're supposed to concentrate on learning, but hearing things like, nigga, why are you here? Today, we still have children who are in schools, and perhaps some of you may be in a school and you have so much other noise on your mind other than learning. But it shouldn't have to do with anything with your race. That's the problem. You know, Carter G. Woodson said, we go to school to learn how to be white people. You know, we, we often talk about how good education is. It's great to be an educated person, but how many of us really look and examine what is being taught and what is being learned? That's critical. We have to be able to change that narrative. You, know, you don't have to dress like them. You don't have to look like them or talk like them or be validated by them to coexist with them. When we accept that kind of freedom, because there is a freedom in there, right? People who even look like you will shun you. But if I don't know anything else, I know this. Uh, Arthur, uh, there's a German philosopher named Arthur Schopenhauer, and he says that truth passes three different stages. First, it will be ridiculed. Secondly, it will be violently opposed. Third, it will be accepted as truth every time. So the prevailing social temperature in our country right now is fueled by what we call microaggressions. Those are those uh, uh, small, often covert slights that are hard to prove that make people feel singled out or discounted. It happens. So little bitty things, I kind of um, compare them to ant bites. One ant bite on your leg may not hurt. If, if you have 100 ant bites on your leg, you can't identify one of them that hurts worse or itches most. Well, with this, this is why uh, sometimes white people are considered assertive while black people are considered angry given the same exact circumstance. This is why Joe, uh, what's his name, Joe Wilson broke the Quorum when he said to President Obama in the Joint Congress, you lie. I remember that. It's also why some white folks, conservatives, especially the poor ones, hate Obamacare, but love the Affordable Health Care Act. <laughs> when it's the same damn thing. <laughs> now I'm just saying. So no matter how you feel about President Obama and his politics, what he has done for this country is create a different way of looking at black people and we have to start examining why we looked at them the way we do. And for 
some people that is very painful. That's why they're saying, man, I can't stand Obama, but I can't tell you why. That's why. Because to do that, they are now questioning everything that they were once knew, known to be as right. 